Happy Wednesday. Uh, we're going to be meeting every Wednesday in one of these meetings uh, to go over parts of the topic that's due. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my PowerPoint screen with you. And we're going to go through a couple things from topic two. Uh, so today is our first video, Wednesday, April 1st. Um, a couple things that should be done by today. Uh, topic one is over. And most of you did the quiz and you did a great job. Uh, so we'll kind of continue with that trend. Um, today we're going to go through just the first three sections of topic two. So I am on page 20 in the review book. And we're just going to go up through page 32 today. We'll do the second part of topic two next week. So the topics we're going to go over today are photosynthesis and respiration, which is going to be a quick review. Enzymes, another quick review. And then we're going to go through some new stuff, which is the section on dynamic equilibrium. At the end of this video, uh, I'm going to clarify some due dates. You no longer have to complete all of the uh, questions in every topic by Wednesday. And then we're starting something new called choice activities, and that's going to be more of your assignment. All right, so to start out, a uh, little question of the day, which we haven't done in a while. Um, I'm gonna come back to you, but what do all of these images have in common? So think about that, um, and we're gonna move forward with the lesson. Okay, so the first section in the review book uh, in topic two, homeostasis in organisms, is on basic biochemical processes of living organisms. And we're going to touch on photosynthesis and cellular respiration. In table 2-1, complex molecules and their function, uh, this is a really good review of these organic molecules from topic one and what they do. So it's really important as we move forward to know that ATP is the molecule that supplies energy. DNA is the molecule that provides your hereditary or genetic information. Carbohydrates and lipids are food reserve molecules and we're gonna focus just on carbohydrates or sugars. And proteins can, um, are a bunch of organisms like enzymes and proteins also make up our organelles. To recap photosynthesis, some of the most important things uh, to read through in this section is where photosynthesis occurs. So within the uh, leaf of a plant is where most of the chloroplasts are found. And chloroplasts are only found in plant cells. That is the organelle here, here, here in green, um, where photosynthesis takes place. The process of photosynthesis is that plants take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. They take in water, either through their roots or through water vapor. And they use sunlight to generate an organic molecule called glucose, which is a carbohydrate or a sugar, and release oxygen gas as a product. If you look on page 20, in the review book, they provide a really good uh, summary. And so I've pulled just two main parts of that summary. The source of the energy for photosynthesis is the sun. Sunlight is the original source of energy for all chemical processes in one way or another. And photosynthesis is important to other organisms because it makes the sugar that we need to make energy and it provides the oxygen that we need to make energy. So what did all these things have in common? All of these images involve some sort of light in nature. So in the upper left corner, you have the Northern Lights phenomenon, rainbow, sunset, and then of course, photosynthesis represented by the forest. So let's try on page 23, Number seven, which is a multiple choice question, and it says, which activity occurs during the process of photosynthesis? Choice one, chemical energy from organic molecules is converted into light energy. 
I'm going to get rid of that one because we know that we use light energy. We do not make light energy. Choice two, organic molecules are absorbed from the environment. Remember that organic molecules are things like carbohydrates, fats, proteins. And in photosynthesis, we do not absorb them. We actually make organic molecules. Choice three, Organic molecules are converted into inorganic food molecules. I agree that we are making food, but we are making organic food like sugar. So I'm also gonna get rid of choice three. So hopefully choice four makes sense for photosynthesis. Light energy is stored as chemical energy in organic molecules. I agree, we use light energy, we store it as chemical energy, inorganic molecules such as sugar or glucose. So choice four is our best choice. Now I'm gonna have you pause the video and I'm gonna try, uh, have you try numbers one through eight on pages 22 to 23. So pause the video, try those questions and tune back in. I'm gonna have you pause the video again and check your answers. Okay, moving on to the next section, a quick review of cellular respiration. I am on page 23 in your review book. Where cellular respiration occurs within cells is in the mitochondria. And as you recall, both plant and animal cells have mitochondria. This process is the reverse of photosynthesis. So we are taking the glucose or sugar and the oxygen made by plants and we are converting it into carbon dioxide, which you exhale, water, which we also use and exhale, and most importantly, the energy storing molecule ATP. The summary of this process, um, if we go back to if the sun is the energy source for photosynthesis, the energy source for cellular respiration is the chemical bonds of the sugar molecule that went into this equation. That is an organic molecule. So we use organic molecules to make energy. This process requires enzymes in order to break the bonds of the sugar so that we can get that uh, energy out of the bonds. We're gonna talk more about enzymes moving forward. And then lastly, we make ATP. And we use ATP for metabolic processes like active transport, growth, movement, and pretty much anything that requires energy. So a good uh, way to think of these processes are one kind of fuels another. So in the chloroplast, we see photosynthesis occur just in plants, and it uses light energy to make glucose, C6H12O6, and oxygen gas. That is used by all organisms, including plants, animals, etc in the mitochondria of the cell to make ATP, chemical energy. Those byproducts, CO2 and H2O, are then used again by plants for the process of photosynthesis, and it's an ongoing cycle. So let's try on page 25, number 17. This is an example of a free response question. Compare photosynthesis and respiration with regard to each of the following. Bullet one, the source of the energy. Well, in photosynthesis, the source of the energy is the sun or sunlight. In respiration, the source of the energy is the glucose molecules, specifically the chemical bonds. The materials used by each process used are reactants, things that go into a chemical process. In photosynthesis, carbon dioxide and water are used, whereas in respiration, we have to use sugar or glucose and oxygen. Third bullet, the location of each process in the cell. Photosynthesis occurs in the chloroplast, whereas respiration occurs in the mitochondria of all cells. And then when each process occurs in plants and animals, well, photosynthesis occurs only in plants, and it occurs 
during the daylight hours. Respiration occurs in all plants and animals, and it happens all the time, nonstop. Now I want you to pause the videos, and on pages 24 and 25, there are four questions that I want you to try on your own, number 9, 10, 11, and 18. So pause the video, try those, and check back. Pause the video again and check your answers. All right, quick little review on enzymes, which starts on page 25. Enzymes are catalysts, and they are specifically protein catalysts that affect the rate of chemical reactions in the body. And all of the chemical reactions in your body is this term that we call metabolism. So metabolic processes are run by enzymes. With enzymes, their shape dictates their function or what they do. If an enzyme is denatured, it means that its shape has changed. So if you look at the graphic, how enzymes work, you will see that the substrate or the molecule that's getting broken down or built is acted upon by an enzyme with a matching shape, like a puzzle piece or a lock and a key. In this, you see that the substrate is being broken down into two products, but enzymes can also build molecules back up. Reaction rates are influenced not only by the shape of the enzyme, but two things that can change the shape of the enzyme are temperature and pH, meaning acid or base. If the temperature is too cold or too hot, that can change the shape of the enzyme and cause it not to work properly. All enzymes have an optimal temperature that they prefer to work at. pH is acidity or basicity, and all enzymes have an optimal pH that they prefer to work at. If it's outside of that pH level, it can change the shape of the enzyme and change the function. In the stomach, those enzymes function at a very low or acidic pH, whereas in the rest of the body, it prefers a more neutral pH, like 7. On page 28, there is a graphic that looks a lot better than what I drew, number 34. So I want to try number 34 together, which is to explain what's happening in steps 1 through 3. One, two, and three. And use labels A through E in your explanation. It also asks you to identify the enzyme and the product. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to identify the enzyme and the product. A, this guy, is the enzyme because it remains unchanged from beginning to end. The product is this E and D. It's what was changed as a result of the enzyme. So explaining what's happening, the enzyme here is acting upon the substrate, which is B. Let's say that it's glucose in cellular respiration. They come together in step two, letter C, and then the enzyme remains unchanged but produces products E and D. So maybe this is breaking the bonds of glucose in cellular respiration. Pause the video again and try numbers 23, 26, 29, and 30 on pages 27 and 28. Pause the video again and check your answers. Okay, last but not least for today, we're going to go through some new information. This is stuff that we have not yet covered in class. This section um, in, in topic two is feedback and homeostasis. So if you have not read through the review book, pages 29 to 32, I would pause and kind of read through that. And then I'm going to go through and explain what this is all about. The human body wants to maintain a steady state at all times, which is homeostasis, a balance. So what the body has uh, going for it is that it maintains these feedback mechanisms and it helps organisms respond to changes in their environment or just stimuli. There are two types of feedback mechanisms. One is positive feedback where one change signals more changes in the same direction. We will pretty much almost never talk about positive feedback again, but childbirth is an example where contractions in the uterine lining during childbirth stimulate 
more contractions. What we see most of the time is the body trying to maintain homeostasis with negative feedback mechanisms. So if you think about maintaining a normal body temperature, when you get too cold, your body wants to counteract that and warm you up. When you get too hot, your body wants to counteract that and cool you down. We're gonna talk about two more examples from the topic. One is maintaining blood sugar, and the second is maintaining water balance in plants. On page 31 of the review book, they talk about maintaining blood sugar. So I found a couple graphics here to help you understand this process and how it pertains to negative feedback. First of all, the pancreas is an organ here just above the stomach and it releases hormones that help maintain your blood sugar. One of those hormones is insulin, which you've probably heard of before. Another one of those hormones is glucagon which is maybe not a hormone that you've heard of before unless you know someone or are someone who has diabetes. This organ helps to maintain blood sugar by recognizing when you have high and low blood glucose levels. So let's say that you have just eaten a meal, your blood glucose increases, you have more sugar in your blood, so your pancreas releases insulin in order to allow your cells to take it out of your blood. So this is gonna lower your blood glucose levels. As your blood glucose levels drop, the pancreas releases a second hormone called glucagon, and its job is to raise your blood glucose levels back up by blocking your cells from taking it in. This is a negative feedback mechanism because it acts in opposite directions. When the blood sugar is too high, your body works to lower it and vice versa. This graph represents your blood sugar over time. So if you are at time zero, this might represent a time when you're hungry and you decide that you need to have something to eat. So over time, after you eat, let's say, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, your blood glucose levels are going to climb, but probably not above 200. At this point, your body is, uh, pancreas is releasing insulin, which is going to cause your blood sugar to drop back to a normal level just above about 100, and it will maintain that steady state. If it gets too low, then the body's going to try to lower it again, or you're going to just be signaled that you're hungry and you need to eat something to counter that. The second example on page uh, 31 is uh, the guard cells in plants, which are found on the bottom surface of a leaf. So if these are all the normal epidermal cells of a leaf, in green, these are the specialized cells called guard cells, and they have openings called stomates that open and close depending on the conditions. They are open typically at night to allow gas exchange and water exchange to occur, but when it's hot, they close up so that they can try to keep the water inside the leaf and it doesn't escape. So this is a feedback mechanism that uh, signals these cells to open and close depending on the water levels inside the plant. So when the water levels are too low, they're going to close these up to keep water in. And when the water is plentiful inside, they will open up to allow more gas exchange to occur. So let's try number 50 together on page 32, which talks about the feedback mechanism of maintaining blood glucose levels. Number 50 says to describe the role of insulin in regulating blood sugar. Um, the first thing I would want to do is to describe the role of insulin. So I would say something like insulin is a hormone that lowers blood sugar. I would also wanna talk about its role in regulating blood sugar. So maybe I would add when blood sugar is high, insulin lowers it. So this brings us to the end of our video.
what do you do now? <laughs> we are going to start something called choice activities. And rather than have you do a bunch of questions out of the review book, you will have that option. Um, I'm gonna have you choose only one of the following uh, to complete for this topic. I would recommend completing this before you take the topic two quiz on Schoology, which won't be until next week because we still have to go through the second half of this topic. So one choice that you have is you could continue working out of the review book. If you're on a roll and you wanna just keep doing some questions, um, if you skip ahead to page 38 and 41, we have the Regents practice. And I'm gonna have you do numbers one through 15, numbers 18 and 19, and then numbers 35 through 37. Um, so if you prefer to do this as your choice activity, you can then check your answers with this, the key that I post on Schoology. If you are sick of doing review book questions, you could also choose one of the activities in the purple folder on Schoology called Choice Activities. You do not have to do the questions and one of these activities. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to show you where to find these activities. As most of you found, um, on Schoology you have the different folders for different topics. In topic two, you will find a purple folder. Well, that's not working. So let's just go back to our PowerPoint. I'll get this back going next week. In the purple folder on Schoology, you are going to find a folder called Choice Activities. So if you would rather do an uh, animation or a game or read an article, there are other choices um, in that folder for you to do. Again, you do not have to do the questions and the choice activities. Since we're spending about two weeks on topic two, I'm going to ask that when you take the topic two quiz next week, you tell me a little bit about which choice activity you chose to complete this week. You don't need to submit your choice to me unless you choose something that involves drawing a model or creating a, a video. So what we're gonna do next week, next Wednesday we'll meet again and we will discuss the last section of topic two on disease and immunity. So before you tune in next Wednesday, you should read through that section before watching the video. Then I'm going to assign the quiz which is not due until the following Sunday. All right, well, that's it for today. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being patient with my first video lesson. And feel free to reach out via Schoology, email, or Remind if you have any questions about anything we went through today. See you later.